Simon Thrush is a professor at Auckland University and director of the Institute of Marine Sciences. His ecological research is focused on understanding human impacts on marine ecosystems. He has worked extensively with social scientists to change management process for the betterment of the environment. For the challenge, he co-leads ecological responses to cumulative effects with Kura Paul Burke, Whakina Mai Te Manawa Nui, uh, ki aia e eke nei ki runga i te taumata kōrero. Haere mai, haere mai, Simon. Kia ora katoa, ko Simon Thrush Toka Ingoa. Um, thanks very much for Kura for really setting the scene particularly well, um, talking about uh, how we think about our connection to the environment, because that, that stuff is really important. <clears throat> My job today really is to talk to you about um, some ecology, some ecosystem science. Um, it seems a no-brainer if you're going to start to think about EBM and um, really set up the, the talks about the future focus that will come from um, some of the people that will talk after me. This is, um, as you can see from the, the date on the, the paper I'm citing here, Carl Falker said this a long time ago. Um, it's a very useful definition of cumulative effects because it points to some very important elements of, of it. Firstly, it's about um, feedbacks in processes that drive change. It's about when small changes have big consequences. Um, I wanted to put that up because when we were talking about the blue economy, there was various kinds of um, discussions around you know, people talking at cross purposes and things. So that's my perspective on what cumulative effects mean. I thought a useful model here would be for us to play a little game of um, northern Ukrainian roulette. Um, so if, if we think about the various stresses that e exist in the environment, you know, if, if you're managing one of those things, um, you can stick it in the chamber, you can roll the chamber, you can pull the trigger, you can see what happens. There's a probability that um, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot or some other body part. Um, and we can figure that out. If you add a second stressor to the mix, roll again, you get a much lower, a much higher probability um, that you're going to have a problem. So this is a cumulative effects metaphor. The problem with this is um, what I'm going to talk about in the rest of my talk. But first, let's remind ourselves of why we should worry. Um, Kura talked from the heart about this. Um, I will talk from um, a, a much broader perspective about our relationship with nature and the world we live in. We value the ocean um, in multiple ways. Again, during the Blue Economy talks, we talked a lot about value. Nobody ever talked about what they meant by value. Um, the oceans are incredibly important to us, and they do many, many things for us. We often think of them as too big to fail. You know, our economic models are essentially based on the wild frontier. Um, the foolish assumption we have is that we've got one left and we don't, um, until Elon Musk gets us all up into Mars. Um, the big deal here really is, um, this is about nature's infrastructure, and the events that we've um, lived through this year have really demonstrated how important infrastructure is to us. And the fact that we've let it fail because we've ignored it um, is shame on us, and, and we're living desperately with those consequences and tragedies right now. Remember, it's not just about a climate crisis. We're in a trifecta of crisis at the moment. We've got a biodiversity crisis, and we've also got a sustainability crisis. Um, this diagram over here 
is um, from a, a study that a bunch of students in Europe did a few years ago. And what it highlights is what's driving down global biodiversity in the oceans. Um, and as you can see, there are multiple causes. It's a cumulative effects problem. Next to that um, is a slide that illustrates that any one of those bullets I was talking about before is not a single problem. It's a multi-dimensional problem. So if we think about fishing, it's not just about the fish stock. It's about multiple other elements, including plastic pollution, including impacts on climate change, including habitat destruction. So we can take any one of those bullets and, and, and split it up, and those effects are immediate, and they're also indirect and long-term. OK, that gives us a problem, because we've now created a massive, massive workload for us to research. That's great, um, if only somebody would pay for it. Um, it's also a massive problem because it creates a huge problem for the management agencies and, and a lot of the management agencies are really not funded to, to do that work. There just isn't money in the system. So we've got this big problem of thinking about do we manage stressors in this kind of stressor cocktail mode, which is the kind of BAU approach, or do we think about the ecosystem response? And I would argue that that's important because that is one of the main reasons why we care. It's because we're losing value, we're losing biodiversity, we're losing ecosystem services. I'm not the only person to think this. There are lots of other clever people who think this. And it is critical that we, um, I think, start to think about if we manage with a focus on ecosystems rather than on stresses, then um, we'll be in a much, much better place. Um, so that, again, is uh, a bit of a framing for how we might think about cumulative effects. So if we're going to do that, and if we're going to try and um, fix something, then it really helps to know how it works if you want to fix it. Anyone who's tried to repair their cell phone will, will understand that. Um, so this little diagram up here shows you how shellfish interact with the microscopic plants that live on the sediment surface that are the fundamental source of primary production in many shallow water ecosystems. It tells you how it interacts with the nitrogen cycle. Uh, the nitrogen cycle is pretty important to you. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of DNA as being wired through your body. Um, the N in DNA is nitrogen. Um, so we need the stuff just like we need oxygen. Um, the nitrogen cycle, when it goes wrong, leads to dead zones, eutrophication, alga bloom, all kinds of bad stuff. That's happening in some parts of New Zealand. So if we don't understand how these systems work and how processes interact, then um, we're, we're really uh, grasping at straws to be able to fix problems. And I would argue that understanding those kinds of networks then becomes really important. We can do that really simply. We can look at how relationships between processes fall apart as we add more and more stresses to the mix. Um, that's a very simple result of an experiment that we did a few years ago, which was about climate change effects. And what it really showed you was that one of the biggest stresses on these systems was making them more turbid. And and making them more turbid really affected those little microscopic plants I was talking about before. And as a consequence of that, the whole system started to fall apart. And we are seeing elevated turbidity and elevated um, events of high turbidity in many of our estuaries around New Zealand. And that diagram there is an illustration of what's going on there. Essentially, we're darkening the environment, making it harder for the plants to do their thing, and that has all kinds of consequences beyond just providing food for something, because the ocean is not just about food. You don't have to eat it to value it. So now let me make that diagram a little bit more complicated, but still very simple, trust me. This diagram here shows you the interactions between various physical, biological, and chemical components within the seafloor environment that interact to make the system work. We've called this an ecosystem interaction network. It also highlights various kinds of stresses that 
can occur and impact on this system. We wanted to test that idea out and, and do an experiment around New Zealand. It is a national science challenge after all, um, where we were looking at how we could, we could affect the system, stress it, and see whether we could break that interaction network. And, and you know, the, the effects we're having here are relatively small. They're not um, major. Our intent was not to kill everything. It wasn't to nuke the system. It was to do small changes with big consequences. Here's a summary of the result of that. And what you can so see from this is the architecture of the network has really changed. As we've made um, as we've stressed the system in more turbid estuaries, we've changed the nature of the network. We've decoupled the processing of nitrogen from the rest of the system. The system isn't doing its job as well now. We've taken away the capacity of the shellfish to engage in the processes. We've weakened the network, reducing the number of positive feedbacks. Remember I said feedbacks were important. We've taken away the number of weak interactions. Those mean the system, we, we've been able to demonstrate that these ecosystems do change their structure. We can measure that, we can identify that, and we can use that for informing management decisions. I thought I'd sl show this slide because um, having worked on sediment impacts for about 30 years now, I've had a number of people talk to me in the last, um, the last few months, surprise, surprise, and, and some of my colleagues too, like this is a problem that New Zealand has never faced before. Um, it is incredibly tragic what's been happening in Northland, Auckland, and um, Tairawhiti and Hawke Bay. Um, but we can see major changes in, in, as a consequence of adding sediment to our coastal zone. When we started doing this work, we were thinking that, you know, depositional events that were dropping about two centimetre thick layers onto the sand flat were, were, were bad. Um, but below that, you know, what's adding a little bit more mud to the system. Um, as we've studied further and further and refined our results, we've got to the point now where we can see very subtle changes in mud content and, as I've just illustrated, changes in um, turbidity that are really affecting these systems and really driving them to um, ecological collapse as a consequence of the unintended consequences of things that we've done on land without thinking that where this really impacts is the coastal ocean, and we don't have very good processes for feeding back between place of impact on ecosystems and the management structures that we generate. We do it all ass about face. <coughs> it is about people as well as nature, of course, and those have to work together. It is the life-supporting um, capacity of our little spaceship. And the important thing about this is that um, people value the system in different ways. Some of us hold multiple values in place. And as we think about managing these ecosystems and taking an ecosystem framework on management, it's critical for us to be thinking about um, the multiple values that people hold. And so this is now a multi-dimensional problem. It isn't just about making more fish in the ocean. It isn't just about growing more seaweed. It's about doing multiple things that serve multiple functions simultaneously. And we have ways that we can do this and inform these decisions and inform the likely consequences of changes in nature. And that, that's a really important thing to us to bear in mind. Otherwise, we'll get into issues where we'll be um, optimizing the behavior of the ecosystem to do one thing for us. We'll essentially be trying to turn it all into rice paddies or cornfields. Um, and, and that's not about biodiversity um, conservation. So let me just kind of um, spend a couple of minutes talking about things to um, introduce the next speakers. The normal way that cumulative effects assessments work when you go to the literature and see how everybody else do it is think about human activity, identify the stresses, look at how the stresses add up or multiply up, and 
how they affect the ecosystem. This is not a very holistic approach. It's a very linear approach. And we would argue it's, it's very ineffective if we're actually going to solve the problem. Our solution here really is to take a much more integrative and ecosystem focused approach. Be thinking about elements of the community. It's not just about the population. It's not just about um, the habitat. It's about how the whole ecosystem responds. And there's a very strong focus here on thinking about resilience and recovery. Again, um, conversations that you've all been aware of in the media over the last few months are pretty clear evidence as to why we need to take that framing as we move forward into the future. So we need to think about cumulative effects within the context of the activities that we engage with. And activities, and as Kura was alluding to very eloquently before, it's also about non-activities. So the fact that nothing has happened of substance in response to research and reports, that's as much an action as the fact that something did happen. And we need to be very careful about that. OK, um, I just thought it would be good for me to give you one last real-world example of change. Um, this is a slide I stole from David Parker when he came up to talk at Auckland University about six months ago um, on his way out the door to go and talk to some international conference. And this is the state of our scallop fisheries. Um, it's a pretty self-evident slide, and, and I've added a few little things on here just um, for, for various uh, reasons. What I, what I wanted you to do here now, though, is, is note that these fisheries are stuffed. Um, the evidence is very clear. It's been clear for a very long time. In my part of the world, um, action of response has really been driven by iwi, who have been rahuing the industry and recreational fishers away from the environment. The government has been MIA. The big red line at the top is the, um, the scallop enhancement process that's been going on in, in Tasman Bay. So this was already a situation where we had artificially engaged in a process to enhance the productivity of, of the scallops because we'd already broken it. <clears throat> and and that, that worked for a while. But it, as you can see, it didn't work for long. And then we've got the situation um, that, that works for the, for the Gulf of Northland. Um, a little red arrow is at the top here. This is about how science works so well in our society. The first red arrow is the first study that was done in New Zealand to demonstrate the impacts of um, scallop dredging on New Zealand. That had obviously no effect. The next arrow was a response to that, where the, in the first arrow we were told by the fishing industry that despite the fact we'd done a very large scale in situ field experiment, this wasn't big enough to affect fisheries. Even though if this was the oil and gas industry, we could have closed the industry down by killing amphipods in a test tube. So that next was the, the world's first large scale demonstration, the trawl and dredge fisheries um, impact biodiversity at the scale of the fishery. As you can see, didn't really do very much. In New Zealand, it, it really did have some effects overseas. The third arrow is a study that we did, which was actually working for the Scallop Enhancement Company, which was demonstrating how, because of the way that they um, impact habitat structure and the community composition on the seafloor, they really enhance the density of predator scavengers. And if you're a baby scallop sitting on the seafloor in a wall of maths, that's the last thing you want. So um, this is really part of why the system has collapsed. Now, in the Marlborough Sands, that fishery has been closed for a long time. And like so many of these systems, they don't just bounce back. And the reason they don't just bounce back is because they're part of an ecosystem. They're not just some um, modeled population living in a, back, a vacuum. They don't bounce back because they interact with other species and they interact with the environment and they, they respond to change. And those are the things we have to understand. So <clears throat> to end, um, one of the things that's critical as we, as we start to think about our future is we need to start thinking about um, shifting our focus. It's not about managing the decline. It's about managing the recovery. So we just need to flip that light switch from 
off to on. And, and taking that restorative focus is, is absolutely critical. Um, it changes the way we think about management, it changes the focus of management, and it really calls to action. And action is what we need. Um, you know, if we think about um, the rate of change in, in the process I've just shown you, that's a 30-year time frame. Um, we, we just can't do that any longer. We need to get our act together. Uh, that's enough from me. Thank you.